the trumpet of the swan. Chapter 21. The Greening Spring. Lewis and Serena were more in love than ever. When spring came, they flew north, Lewis wearing his trumpet and his slate and his chalk pencil and his medal, Serena wearing nothing at all. Now that he no longer had to work and earn, Lewis felt a great sense of relief. No more would he have to carry a money bag around his neck. The two swans flew high and fast, 10,000 feet above the earth. They arrived at last at the little pond in the wilderness where Lewis had been hatched. This was his dream, to return with his love to the place in Canada where he had first seen the light of day. He escorted Serena from one end of the pond to the other and back again. He shouldered a tiny island where his mother's nest had been. He showed her the log Sam Beaver had been sitting on when Lewis had pulled his shoelace because he couldn't say, Beep! Serena was enchanted. They were in love. It was spring. The frog was waking from his long sleep. The turtle was coming to life again after his nap. The chipmunk felt the warm air, soft and kind. Blow through the trees just as it did in that springtime when Lewis's father and mother had visited the pond to nest and raise their young. The sun shone down strong and steady. Ice was melting. Patches of open water appeared on the pond. Lewis and Serena felt the changing world, and they stirred with new life and rapture and hope. There was a smell in the air, a smell of earth waking after its long winter. The trees were pulled out tiny green buds. The buds were swelling. A better, easier time was at hand. A pair of mallard ducks flew in. A swallow with a white throat arrived and sang, Oh, sweet Canada, Canada, Canada. Serena chose a muskrat log on which to build her nest. It was the right height above the water. The muskrats had built it of mud and sticks. Lewis had hoped his wife might decide to make her nest in the same spot where his mother had built hers. But females are full of notions and they want their own way, pretty much, and Serena knew what she was doing. Lewis was so delighted when he saw her beginning to construct the nest, he didn't really care where it was. He raised his horn to his mouth and played the beginning of an old song called It's Delightful to be Married to be 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 married. Then he helped by bringing a few pieces of coarse grass. Rain or shine, cold or warm, every day was a happy day for the two swans. In time, the eggs were laid and the cygnets were hatched, four of them. The first sound the baby swans heard was the pure, strong sound of their father's trumpet. Oh, ever in the greening spring he played, by bank and bow, and, and bow retiring. Life was gay and busy and sweet in the little lonely pond in a north wood. Once in a while, Sam Beaver would show up for a visit, and they would have great times together. Lewis never forgot his old jobs, his old friends, or his promise to the hit man in charge of birds in Philadelphia. As the years went by, he and Serena returned each spring to the pond, nested, and had their young. And each year at the end of summer, when the molt was over and the flight feathers grew back in, and the cygnets were ready to try their wings, Lewis took his family for a long pleasure trip across America. He led them first to Camp Kukuskus, where he had saved the life of Applegate Skinner and won his medal. The camp would be closed for the season, but Lewis liked to revisit it and wander around remembering the boys and how he had earned his first hundred dollars as Camp Bugler. Then the swans would fly to Boston, where the swan boatman always gave them a big welcome. Lewis would polish up his horn, blow the spit out of it, and swim in front of the boats again, playing row, row, row your boat. And the people of Boston would hear the familiar sound of the trumpet of the swan and would flock to the public garden. Then the boatmen would treat Lewis and Serena to a night at the Ritz Hotel, while the cygnets spent the night by themselves on the lake, watched over by the boatmen. Serena dearly loved the Ritz. She ate dozens of watercress sandwiches and gazed at herself in the mirror and swam in the bathtub, 
And while Lewis stood and looked out of the window at the public garden down below, Serena would walk round and round, turning light on and off for the fun of it. Then they would both get into the bathtub and go to sleep. From Boston, Lewis would lead his family to the Philadelphia Zoo and show them Burt Lake. Here, he would be greeted warmly by the head man in charge of birds. If the zoo needed a young trumpeter swan to add to its collection of waterfowl, Lewis would donate one of his signets, just as he had promised. In later years, Philadelphia was also the place where they would see Sam Beaver. Sam took a job with the zoo just as soon as he was old enough to go to work. He and Lewis always had a great time when they got together. Lewis would get out of his slate and they would have a long talk about old times. After visiting Philadelphia, Lewis would fly south with his wife and children so they could see the great savannas where alligators dozed on the swamp water and turkey buzzards soared in the sky and then they would return home to spend the winter in the Red Rock Lakes of Montana, in the lovely serene Centennial Valley where all trumpeter swans fell safe and unafraid. The life of a swan must be a very pleasant and interesting life, and of course Lewis's life was particularly pleasant because he was a musician. Lewis took good care of his trumpet, he kept it clean and spent hours polishing it with the tips of his wing feathers. As long as he lived, he felt grateful to his father, the brave cop who had risked his life in order to give him the trumpet he needed so badly. Every time Lewis looked at Serena, he remembered that the sounds of the trumpet was what, was what had made her willing to become his mate. Swans often live to be very old. Year after year, Lewis and Serena returned in spring to the same small pond in Canada to raise their family. The days were peaceful, always just at the edge of dark where the young cygnets were getting sleepy. Lewis would raise his horn and play taps, just as he used to do at camp long ago. The notes were sad and beautiful as they floated across the still water and up into the night sky. One summer, when Sam Beaver was about twenty, he and his father were sitting in their camp in Canada. It was after supper. Mr. Beaver was rocking in a chair, resting after a day of fishing. Sam was reading a book. Pop, said Sam, what does crepuscular mean? How should I know, replied Mr. Beaver. I have never heard that word before. It has something to do with rabbits, said Sam. It says here that a rabbit is a crepuscular animal. Probably means timid, said Mr. Beaver. Or maybe it means that it can run like the Dickens. Or maybe it means stupid. A rabbit will sit right in the middle of the road at night and stare into your headlights and never get out of the way. And that's how a lot of the rib, rap, lot of rabbits get run over. They're stupid. Well, said Sam, I guess the only way to find out what crepuscular means is to look it up in the dictionary. We haven't got a dictionary here, said Mr. Beaver. You'll have to wait till you get back to the ranch. Just then, over at the pond where the swans were, Lewis raised his horn and played taps to let his children know that the day had come to an end. The wind was right and the sound carried across the swamp. Mr. Beaver stopped rocking. That's funny, he said. I thought I heard the sound of a trumpet just then. I don't see how you could, replied Sam. We're alone in these woods. I know we are, said Mr. Beaver. Just the same, I thought I heard a trumpet, or a bugle. Sam chuckled. He had never told his father about the swan in the pond nearby. He kept their secret to himself. When he went to the pond, he always went alone. That's the way he liked it, and that's the way the swans liked it. Whatever happened to your friend Lewis? asked Mr. Beaver. Lewis was a trumpeter. You don't suppose he's somewhere around here, do you? He might be, said Sam. Have you heard from him recently? asked Mr. Beaver. No, replied Sam. He doesn't write any more. He ran out of postage stamps, and he has no money to buy stamps with. Oh, said Mr. Beaver. Well, the whole business about that bird was very queer. I never did fully understand it. Sam looked across at his father and saw that his eyes had closed. 
Mr. Beaver was falling asleep. There was hardly a sound to disturb the stillness of the woods. Sam was tired and sleepy too. He got out his notebook and sat down at the table by the light of the kerosene lamp. This is what he wrote. Tonight I heard Lewis's horn. My father heard it too. The wind was right and I could hear the notes of taps just as darkness fell. There is nothing in all the world I like better than the trumpet of the swan. What does crepuscular mean? Sam put his notebook away. He undressed and slid into bed. He lay there wondering what crepuscular meant. In less than three minutes, he was fast asleep. On the pond where the swan swans were, Lewis put his trumpet away. The cygnets crept under their mother's wings. Darkness settled on woods and fields and marsh. A loon called its wild night cry. As Lewis relaxed and prepared for sleep, all his thoughts were of how lucky he was to inhabit such a beautiful earth, how lucky he had been to solve his problems with music, and how pleasant it was to look forward to another night of sleep and another day tomorrow, and a fresh morning, and a light that returns with the day. 